Hey everyone and welcome to the Retro Channel. Today we're going to be looking at the full-size Vic 2 Kawari. This is a project by Randy Rossi that I've previously shown on the channel, at least the mini version of this. But today we're looking at the full-size one which outputs HDMI and it can also do RGB and VGA signals as well. For this I'm going to focus pretty much solely on the HDMI output. Uh, the features of these boards I did go over in the video that looked at the mini version of this. So yeah, we're pretty much looking at HDMI. Keep in mind that this thing does not output audio over HDMI, so it's technically a DVI signal over HDMI. Uh, the reason being for that, I guess, would be the licensing fees on HDMI. So I'm also going to take a look at a HDMI audio embedder. This could be handy for not only the Kawari here, but also something like the Game Gear HD that I showed recently. Uh, it outputs digital video, but there's no audio included in that. And I guess something like the RGB to HDMI project could use a similar kind of thing. So all of those things output a digital video signal, but they don't include the audio. So something like this should be able to take a digital video signal over HDMI and then add either analog or optical audio and spit that out as a full HDMI video audio signal. So we'll take a look at that once we get the Quarry installed. I'm using the Australian case C64 that I recently put a replacement RF modulator in. So I'm going to have to make a couple of changes here in order to route the HDMI cable out of the case. The Quarry board has a micro HDMI connector, so that plugs in there. And all we need to do is figure out how we're going to get this out of the case. So let's get started. So the reason I'm using this machine again is because I've already got the ARM2 sit in there, which gives me stereo audio output. So I may as well throw some more upgrades at it. I'm still yet to do a kernel switcher and install the hard reset switch from this board. So um, there's still plenty of upgrades that can be done here. So uh, let's keep going. First things first, I'm actually going to pop out the RF replacement because I want to remove this S-Video connector and that'll give me a spot to route the HDMI cable out of. As I said in the RF build video, uh, removing these can be dangerous because eventually you're going to start lifting pads from the original RF modulator holes. So I'll try my best not to destroy anything, but see how we go. This right here, which is the Luma Chroma bypass, I probably won't use with the Quarry. It already outputs a really clean signal, so uh, it's probably unnecessary. Uh, in this case, but maybe we'll try it out with the Luma Chroma bypass and also having the Luma Chroma signals run across the main board to the RF modulator, see if there is actually any difference on this one. Right, we still only have that one pad missing that was missing before and I never even ended up finding, so don't even know if I ripped it out myself, but the RF board is out. Now I'm gonna get the S-Video connector off this thing. All right, managed to get it off. Now, of course, if I destroyed this board, I could easily order more from our channel sponsor, PCBWay. Yes, on PCBWay, you'll find this RF modulator replacement plus a whole lot more. So while you're there, be sure to check out their shared projects section. They also do 3D printing, CNC machining, and SMD assembly. So PCBWay is your one-stop shop for all your PCB prototyping needs. We thank them for sponsoring today's video. So what I'm thinking with this thing is to use a little cable tie and then have our HDMI connector running out of the case this way and using these previous holes for the S-Video output and tying that around here to act as a bit of a strain relief for this thing. Probably should check that this actually fits through the case. Not quite, but it's close enough that we can just trim the edges down a little. I think this case is very similar to the 64C with the round uh, RF hole. So don't know if every HDMI cable is going to be easily able to fit through that either. But um, certainly on the bread bins, they have a much larger hole for the RF. So I wouldn't imagine fitting a micro HDMI connector through it would be any issue. In fact, I'm pretty sure they split in half where the RF is. So no problem there. But the Australian case and the 64C case may put up a challenge. Either way, I'm pretty sure I can just shave down the corners of this thing a little bit. All right. 
right, so that's gonna go there. This is a tight fit with the smallest cable tie that I've got. Obviously when I designed this board, I wasn't expecting to have a HDMI output in its place. Cool, so it'll sit something like that. Hopefully I'll be able to tighten this up enough to actually hold the cable. Maybe I should put a grommet there too. It's the wrong trousers grommet. All right, that should hopefully just help to bulk up this area and hold the cable pressed down to the board. The good thing about not having the S-Video connector is I don't really have to worry too much about the height of the RF modulator to line up with that hole. Pop out the old VIC-2. So the quarry should just fit within this can. I think some machines it's not gonna fit in the can properly and you'll actually have to remove the metal around it, but this should be able to fit just over all these little caps here. Just try and flatten them a little bit. Oh, and the Lumachroma thing. We'll try it with the Lumachroma bypassed at first. I don't think it's gonna make much of a difference. Obviously it won't make any difference at all for the HDMI output, cause that's all generated on the board. But for the, um, the composite and the S-Video output, it may still help. And having the extra socket gives us a little bit more height. So it should make it a bit easier to clear all the components underneath here. There we go. Remember to plug them in, otherwise we'll have no analog video out. Now, of course, even without the S-Video connector, you're still gonna have all the video signals on the standard Commodore 64 DIN connector. So there's no issue with removing the S-Video connector from this board. You don't even have to install it in the first place if you don't want to. I just found it a convenience to have S-Video straight from the Commodore 64 without having a mess with DIN cables for this thing. Plug that in, give it a little bit of a bend just so there's a little bit of play so we don't accidentally, you know, pull it out through the back, but I think this little cable tie should help hold it in place. Or it might not do anything at all. Yeah, maybe that grommet was a bad idea, it doesn't compress down enough. Bad grommet. Out you go. Ah, cut the cable tie too. No. All right, sorry about the little jump cut there. I had some choice words that I wanted to share with this machine off camera. So we now have another cable tie in place. I used this little grinding tool to uh, actually grind out some of the S-Video connector holes. So it's not gonna make a big deal because they're just ground holes anyway. But uh, yeah, should have thought of this to begin with, I think. Anyway, cable ties in place so I can now safely strap this down. It's about as tight as I can get it, but it's not moving. The board's moving. Cool. So I think we're ready to see what this thing can do. Might just screw this all back into place as well. All right, so I've got the laptop out. I'm just gonna run this into this very cheap uh, HDMI capture device that I normally use, so. We'll plug that in there, plug that into the computer. I probably should hit record on OBS. Not gonna worry about audio just yet. Let's see what we got. Well, I have a big bright red LED and I have nothing in OBS. Okay, uh, I'm really hoping that it's not the quarry. Maybe it's just the cable, maybe it's the capture setup. Uh, let's try the analog video out. All right, RetroTink 5X, just running on composite. So the HDMI goes into that same capture device. Okay, cool, we've got an image. For a composite image, it's actually pretty nice, but that does mean this is working. Uh, is it gonna be this cable? I really don't wanna pull that out again. Let's try a different display just in case. All right, El Cheapo Janky LCD display. Plug the HDMI straight into there. Power on. All right, cool. So DVI signal, what was that? Seven, 
764 by 494 at 60 hertz. Ooh, now it's being weird again. So it is quite a odd video signal. Um, maybe that's why this display doesn't really like it that much and the capture device doesn't like it at all. I don't know if there's any adjustments we can do to that. I wonder what it would be like through the little audio embedder if that changes the signal in some way. Hmm. The audio embedder puts up color bars when there's no signal. That's neat. All right, so this is going through this and then to the display. Does that make any difference? All right, still the same resolution and refresh. But we're not losing sync anymore. Let's just try that without the embedder one more time. And now I get nothing at all. Nothing at all. Is this seated properly? Now I do get something. Okay, well, it's not dropping out this time. Maybe this socket isn't great. No. Maybe it wasn't plugged in there properly before. Anyway, let's see if this through the audio and better works with the capture device. Interesting. No, black screen. So my little cheapo HDMI to USB capture device does not like the signal from the Quarry. Might not be a big deal because it's only one device that I've really tested it with, apart from this thing. And well, that had a random issue, but that could have just been me. Does kind of mean, however, that I'm not gonna be able to use the capture device to get this footage. So we might just rely on this little display. So after having a look on the GitHub page, it does mention that certain displays won't be compatible with this. And I guess that cheap capture device is one of them. So we're gonna use the janky LCD display. Uh, I guess it's gonna be good enough for this. So there we go. Uh, that is obviously running in NTSC mode at the moment and the image is a little bit shifted over to the left. Like the mini board, there is a jumper that you can bridge in order to switch to the opposite video mode on boot. So 764 by 528 at 50 hertz is the PAL mode. Yeah, that also works with this display and also doesn't work with the USB capture device that I've got. Let's hook up this keyboard and take it for a spin. There, and the keyboard does not sit properly over the Kawari. That could potentially be an issue with the Australian case and also the C64C case. Probably not so much with the bread bins because there's more height above the Vic. But um, yeah, I'm just going to remove my Luma Chroma bypass, which will allow me to remove the extra socket underneath. And that should hopefully lower it down enough to fit the case over properly. In fact, what I just noticed is the quarry has two sockets on it already, so hopefully that will get it low enough. My guess is there's already two sockets installed just to clear everything on the motherboard, so that should be low enough, I think. Let's see. Yes, that closes just fine, so... Luma Chroma bypass with the Quarry on this particular setup isn't going to work because, well, not in the, not with using an extra socket like this. So not a big deal. The Quarry, as I said, puts out a pretty clean Luma Chroma signal. So I don't think it's going to make much of a difference, if any. I will need to go back in and just bridge the uh, connectors on my RF modulator replacement just so it passes Luma Chroma back through through the main board. But that's not an issue right now because we're just looking at HDMI anyway. All right, sorry about the reflection, mostly from my glasses on this screen, but uh, this is going to have to do. So yeah, looks very sharp. Uh, obviously, this is a pretty small display and not a high resolution one, but yeah, it looks pretty good from here. All right, let's have a look at the config utilities. Again, all this stuff is available on Randy's GitHub page, so always check there first for updated versions and help with that kind of thing. 
So the Quarry is running firmware version 1.10, which I think is the latest one. And yeah, the utility version, which is the program that's running is 1.3. Chip model, I'm going to change this to the PAL version by default. Save that. Raster lines. Simulates raster lines for RGB based videos. So as I'm using HDMI and not the RGB output, that's not gonna make a difference here. DVI RGB pixel width. I wonder if changing that, let's change that reboot, see what the display resolution reports. In fact, just changing that may have just changed the resolution and caused the screen not to sync with it. All right, cool. So space and then save, cause it to drop out and then hitting space and save again, gets us back to turning that off, which works properly. <laughs> so uh, let's not play with that. All right, nothing much else to see here. Let's load up the RGB editor. I think this will change things with the HDMI output as well. It's one way to find out. Yes, the black is turning red. In fact, before I do all this, I should reboot it because I've now set it to PAL. So, all right, now we're in PAL mode. All right, so the RGB color editor, in theory, this will also affect the HDMI output. Let's just, let's change this border color from 0D to, well, there we go. We're getting a purple border. Let's save that. Reboot the machine. Yes, that does indeed affect the um, the HDMI output. I'm guessing we can just hit R to revert all changes. Or maybe that just reverts changes that we've made since we loaded up the program. Uh, next preset. Oh, oh, oh my. Right, well, that one looks the best. Just like with the mini version, uh, you can go through and change the color palette if you like. Uh, I did find on the mini version that the color palette looked fairly off from what I'm used to with the power model. So I did go through and make a number of changes to the color palette. With the HDMI version, I'm not gonna play with this right now. It looks, it looks, pretty accurate. Uh, the way I did it with the Quarry Mini was to get a direct capture from both the Quarry Mini and a normal C64 and just compare them on the computer, but I can't really do that here, so I'm just going to roll with this. Let's save that. Let's have a look at the Easy Flash 3 menu because I'm very used to seeing that. Yeah, the color palette seems off. Could also be this display as well. Apart from that, it looks razor sharp. Like, ridiculously so. Let's just load up the test build generator. This is what I normally use for checking out, you know, different display modes and that kind of thing. White looks white. Yeah. Ooh, that green looks a bit uh, olive green. Doesn't seem about right. Yeah, that's so sharp. This flickering up here is actually from the Commodore 64. It's, yeah just part of this program. <laughs> Crazy sharp. Neat. Right, well, let's try and embed some audio, see if that works. So with the little audio embedder, we're gonna hook up the HDMI from the Commodore 64 to the input here. And obviously the output's gonna run to this display and we're gonna feed it audio from this line input. And thanks to my RF modulator replacement, I can plug that directly in the back there. That looks better. So that's coming from the audio on better. Let's power this on. It should switch to PAL mode. Yes. Now, one thing I do notice is that audio on better adds some sharpening to the image. So everything has a bit of a halo around it. I'm not a fan of that. User mode, always. Oh, still can't change the sharpness. 
Oh, I can change the sharpness. Why is that grayed out in the other menu? And is it changing anything? It's hard to tell on this screen. Yes, it does. Okay, so I can just turn the sharpness down, get rid of those edge enhancements. Yeah, look at that. It makes you jump right over it, but if you're actually in the menus, then you can scroll down and change it. Go figure. Noise reduction off. Okay. Right, that looks a bit more natural. Let's see if we got sound. We do. So even though the quarry is only putting out the digital video signal, the HDMI audio embedder can embed the analog sound from the 64 and stick all that together to make one neat and tidy HDMI solution. It's crazy how sharp that is. I think the quarry just does line doubling in order to generate the HDMI signal. So rather than 15 kilohertz, it's 30 kilohertz. So it's literally a single line buffer. So there's practically zero lag. All right, I'm gonna go test this on a few other displays that I've got around the house, see uh, which ones play nicely with it and which ones don't. All right, so I did a quick test with the other HDMI displays that I've got around the house. Uh, the plasma that's in here is from probably the late 2000s and it didn't play nicely with that. But the other TVs that I've got all worked. There's an LCD from mid 2010s that worked and a, OLED TV from the late 2010s that also worked with it. So I think just earlier HDMI displays may have issues, but I guess you're not really gonna know until you try it out yourselves. So I'm pretty happy that the majority of my HDMI devices worked with this. Uh, it's a bit of a shame about the plasma in here, but I can get around that. I could also look at the uh, RGB output as well. That could be a workaround for both the plasma and for something like the Commodore monitors because they do handle analog RGB, that could be an even better way to get a really clean image. In saying that, my RF modulator replacement just with Luma Chroma and one of the Commodore monitors produces a pretty outstanding image as it is. So I don't know how much more we could squeeze out of that, but it might be something that I'll look at in the future. With the HDMI audio and better, I did actually open this up and it's just obviously a tiny circuit board inside. So it could even be possible to mount this somewhere inside the Commodore case, obviously supply it with five volts power from the main board somewhere and then just have everything all internal and a single HDMI cable running out the back with audio and video. But uh, I'll need to look into that further before I commit to something like that. Either way, I think the large size HDMI Quarry is certainly a good product if you want HDMI out of your Commodore 64. I've ordered one myself because this one doesn't actually belong to me. Again, I uh, borrowed this off Nathan, who's a local retro nut. And in between that time, I actually ordered one of these from Video Game Perfection. So uh, I think they're still available there. I'm not affiliated with them in any way, but that's just where they're currently available from. So I've got one of these on the way, plus the mini board on the way, because I've got a few applications in mind for them. So in summary, I'm pretty happy with how this is working. And once again, this is pretty much designed for the longboard Commodore 64s. The short boards have some timing issues that I think Randy is working on, but there's no guarantees on that. And obviously the 128s use a different VIC-2 chip, so it's not gonna work in them. But if you want the highest video quality out of your Commodore 64, this is pretty much the only way to go. Obviously something like my RF replacement can help with the composite and Luma Chroma, even from the full-size HDMI query, because those signals still have to run through the RF modulator. So if you're using the original one, you're still gonna suffer from a bit of interference and blurriness with the original RF modulators. And you know, even mine can't work miracles, but it does at least allow a neat place to run the HDMI cable out of if you remove the S-Video connector. And of course, you've still got the audio output there. But having both of these in the machine certainly makes for a better all-round experience. Again, a huge thanks to Nathan for lending me this one. And thanks to Randy, of course, for designing the Quarry in the first place. I'm gonna play around a little bit more with this thing, 
Maybe I'll do another video where we look at the RGB side. I guess let me know in the comments if you'd be interested in that kind of thing. As always, a huge thanks to the people that support the channel on Patreon. And if you want to do the same, links are in the video description. But for now, I'm just going to chill out with some Commodore 64 games. So thanks for watching. Bye.